eight, seven, six. Hello and welcome to the Starboard Portal. I'm Justine and today we have U.S. Sailing Team athletes Stu McNay and David Hughes joining us. On Tuesday of this week, U.S. Sailing announced that the Men's 470 team Stu McNay and David Hughes officially earned selection to the Tokyo 2020 U.S. Olympic Sailing Team and nominated to Team USA. As Olympic veterans, McNay and Hughes have had a long history of success in the Men's 470 class. Tokyo 2020 will be McNay and Hughes' fourth and second games as athletes, respectively. Together, the team finished fourth overall at the 2016 Rio Games and has stood on the podium in several major international events over the years. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for being with us this afternoon and taking a break from your on-the-water training. Um, so tell me, where, where are you two right now in the country? I know it, the team is kind of spread out after um, we went into a lockdown with COVID, um, but you two are together, so that's great, um, but I, I believe pretty recent. Um, so, uh, Stu, you want to tell me where you guys are, are currently located? We're in Wareham, Massachusetts right now. Um, Dave has been here for a couple weeks, and Thomas, our coach, and his wife, Kate, and then my wife, Tanya, and my two kids. Um, we're all, we're all here and um, we have a nice little place to launch across the street at my old brother's house actually. And, uh, and there's also a welcoming community around us. The, the Beverly Yacht Club has offered that we train out of their facility and I think we'll take them up on that offer in July. And of course, we've also talked to a number of places in Rhode Island as as well, who, who have been very welcoming also. Awesome. I mean, can't think of a much better place in the summer than being up in the, on the New England coast, getting some training in, and it sounds like a, a family team affair. So uh, good stuff. Um, but so you two have been together, I think now um, training for eight years. And uh, Dave, you want to tell us a little bit about what that journey been, has been like um, as a team? Uh, sure. Uh, Stu and I have known each other for uh, perhaps 15 years or more, uh, competing against each other in uh, in 470s, you know, back in the day, so to speak. And uh, I actually lost a trials to Stu many quads ago. Um, but since then, we've forged a relationship and have obviously been in touch. Um, during the 2012 quad, uh, Stu uh, represented the States, uh, in the 470 and I was coaching, um, 49ers for team USA. And right after the Olympics, I, I want to say that October, uh, 2012, we, we actually sailed together for the first time in the 470 and, um, began our season in earnest, uh, that following, uh, January at the Miami regatta in 2013. And we've been sailing together ever since. Awesome. Um, so you kind of hit on it a little bit. Stu, do you want to tell me a little bit about the transition from competitors to teammates um, uh, in the same boat? So both of you competing against each other in the 470 class initially and now uh, teaming up to be a pretty strong team together. Yeah. Um, you know, after, after the 2012 Olympics, um, we, decided to, uh, we decided to work with each other. I, uh, and we took it one step at a time. I, uh, we both had a lot of respect for each other going into it. And, um, while we were talking about our, our potential future program, a lot of our goals and philosophies were in alignment with one another and and so we decided it was uh, it was it was a partnership worth exploring, and we took it one step at a time. We trained for the Miami World Cup in 2013, which we ended up winning, and so we decided to take the show to Europe, and we had a successful first season, which culminated 
in a sixth place finish at the world championships that summer. And so we, um, we went full bore from there on out and, and had a, a, a number of moments, which, um, which we were really proud of last quad in this quad as well. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, teaming up and going strong ever since. So never looking back. Um, super good to see. I know um, you two are veterans on the team, um, this U S sailing team uh, amongst many young athletes and uh, definitely take a leadership role. But Dave, do you want to talk a little bit um, about how kind of both years experiences of going to a couple games, um, Dave, you as a, a coach at one and athlete at others, um, but just kind of that level of experience um, that you've been able to bring to the U.S. sailing team um, in general. Uh, yeah, sure. The, w- what's interesting is when I look back on my Olympic career, um, I've experienced it from a few different viewpoints, as you say, and uh, you know, one of which uh, I really enjoyed was uh, the 2004 games. And I went as a, as a training partner and that was illuminating because I, I learned what preparation was like leading into the Olympics and um, clearly going as a coach, you, you learn about prioritization, which is often quite difficult as an athlete to sort through. And then obviously going as an athlete, that is, you know, that is ultimately the job that we're all trying to trying to do. So um, I personally have found that that going in a, in a variety of capacities has been super helpful. And every single time I, I tend to have more questions answered and probably more questions posed. But uh, this is definitely a game in which experience pays off. Yeah, no, awesome. Um, Stu, do you have anything to add about just kind of the experience that that you have that you've been able to share with um, your younger teammates on the U.S. sailing team, just kind of being a, on a more veteran role? Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to lead by example. And so in trying to put my best foot forward and Dave and I as a team putting our best foot forward, we try to set an example that can be emulated by others. Um, And and then also the team has put in increasing amount of energy into um, uh, having having the younger generation spend more time with the older generation. So, we, we get to learn from each other. I learned from them, you know, it's, you know, the younger people have interesting, interesting perspectives and different experiences. And I'm sure they gain from uh, being around us as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think you, you, t- you both kind of touched on it is this uh, methodical approach that you two have adopted. And it's really been a part of, I think, sailing the 470. It's so important with such a complex boat. Um, but how is uh, your mindset today uh, different from kind of a year outside of the, the Rio Olympics and what you've kind of developed and honed in on and worked towards um, from an b- approach standpoint? Um, Dave, if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, that, that's a pretty <laughs> complex and layered question, but uh, I would say the simple answer is that a- as we become better athletes and with more miles under our belt, we have a more mature approach to um, the specific goals within our campaign and the specific uh, realities within our campaign, like i.e. What's, what is possible in a, in a given amount of time, what uh, limitations we're dealing with, uh, what type of, of micro goals that we need to tackle in order to have uh, macro gains, you know, at regattas and at the Olympics. And it's quite easy as an Olympian to look back on previous events and obviously the Olympic games and pinpoint where 
things went well or where things may have gone wrong. Um, but the maturity comes in recognizing that it's not necessarily that binary. It's, it's about realizing how you're trying to improve. And even though it sounds like a little bit of a bumper sticker, it's, um, you truly are trying to just get better with every race in the regatta and be a better sailor by the end of the Olympics as you were when you started the Olympics. And you have to do that at every event and at every training camp. One thing that's been fascinating for Stu and I, you know, we sail a lot of boats, keel boats, dinghies, um, I mean, you name it. And each day we sail the 470, we end up coming away with stuff that we, we kind of laugh about and, and, and are amused about. We say, wow, this has never happened before. That's interesting. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's comical and other times it's a real lesson, you know, an example of which is we have recently been working on, um, you know, some different techniques with just uh, application of trapeze weight and, um, and hiking weight. And, you know, we've discovered things in this very last couple of days. So that's, what's beautiful about the Olympic game. It is never truly over and having been to many Olympics, you know, be, between all of us and, and including our coach, you realize that, uh, I think as a, as a first time Olympic athlete, you have this sense that the Olympics is a conclusion and by many respects it is because they do hand out the medals and you need to get one. Um, but as you return to the big dance, you recognize that it, it's basically a continuation. Yeah, awesome. And um, I guess this one is a, even longer of a continuation, right? Getting a, a year delay. And I think uh, it's a, a mixed bag of feeling across uh, sports and athletes, kind of what, how that is affecting their, their approach and their training. But uh, Stu, do you want to talk a little bit about how this extra time um, to the games has changed kind of your training plans or your approach? I know you um, personally are balancing quite a bit. You have a whole family. And, yeah. Uh, we're, we're all under COVID. So lots, uh, it's not just easy, simple. Um, uh, absolutely anyway. not easy and simple. That's a great question, Justine. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, first and foremost, we're looking at this as an opportunity. It's, uh, it's a great chance to, to complete some projects, which, which we had on the table, which we wouldn't have had time to fully compete, fully complete otherwise, mm -hmm. um, whether it's working on certain techniques or otherwise, um, you know, if I, it's also also presents some huge challenges, like um, you know, a lot of things within my family were structured around the conclusion of the Olympics at the end of August this summer. Uh, but luckily my wife is heavily invested as well. And, um, and my kids are loving it now too. So it actually is, um, it could be a great thing that this is going on as is, and it's really wonderful for, my kids to be able to see the 470, to see Dave, Thomas, and I training. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's bringing things together in a, in a holistic way, which might help performance at the end. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh a holistic full family affair. That is super cool that your kids, uh, I mean, I'm sure they hear of all the the stories on the road and dad traveling, but to to then see kind of it all in action is probably a, a super rewarding experience yeah. for them. So that's awesome. They love it. They absolutely love it. We usually, when we get back in from a day of practice, uh, uh, Stu's son, who is uh, what, almost three, two and a half? Two and a half. Two and a half. He likes to get in the boat and play with all the cleats and ropes. 
Um, <laughs> however, both kids the other day were on the four deck of the 470 and, and thought it'd be fun to start jumping. And we, we had to kind of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a no, no. <laughs> we, had, we had to kind of lay the law down, but, uh, far from that, it's been awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm sure you're, I mean, as a father, just super inspiring to them, but, um, maybe let's talk a little bit. I mean, I know you two are veterans on the team, but it wasn't always the case and you were the young guns and what were some of the um, kind of those, the people that you looked up up to and um, a spot kind of provided inspiration to, to, I mean, keep you on this track of pursuit that you two have been following the last, um, I mean, decade, decade plus, um, Dave. Uh, yeah, I think I can probably speak for Stu here, but we, we grew up uh, being the youngsters in the in the Paul Forrester era, and and you know watching Paul and his teammate Kevin uh, and their approach to to the sport of sailing, and and obviously Paul is known for his his scientific uh, approach and his um, his dogged commitment to practice. Uh, that was that was basically what established our perspective on 470 sailing. And uh, I would like to think that we've kept that tradition that he, he set for us. Um, obviously we've been involved with a, a variety of Olympic teams with, you know, every team feels so different and has so many characters on it. And you tend to, you tend to take away some fascinating perspectives from every athlete, whether they're older or younger at each team. Um, you know, we've, we, even though I was coaching in the 2012 team uh, and Stu was there too, we, we obviously spent a lot of time together and learned from each other. And, um, you know, and probably the, the biggest influencer uh, for both of us um, and, and specifically for me um, would, would have been Trevor Moore, uh, who is no longer with us, um, but he was, he was part of our 2012 team. And he's just uh, an exceptional human being who, you know, it's uh, chokes me up even to, to think about it, but uh, we miss him. Yeah, no, great, great guy. Um, I think he, he holds a dear spot in most people's hearts that knew him. So um, for sure. Um, so we've talked a little bit about kind of, your full balance, uh, a little bit of your inspiration, which before I move on, Stu, did, did Dave hit all the inspires in your life? I, I know. Oh, said yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, th th there are m more people than you could specifically say for sure. You, you know, there's, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a, it's a wide range of individuals. Our first 470 coach, Skip White, he he got the ball rolling and and taught us some critical things. He dragged our our young group around Europe for a couple of seasons. And uh, you know, I've uh, I've worked with Nigel Cochran. Um, Zach Leonard has been a big influence. Um, last squad we worked with Morgan Reeser a whole bunch and so just there are right now we're working with Thomas Barrows and so th there are just there's so many interesting and talented people who have who have a lot to share and um, I, I think it's one of the fun parts of the sport to be able to 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 incorporate their ways and their thought processes into your own. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think you hit it on the head there, Stu. I mean, just the the sailing world in the States is such a, such a small tight knit community where there is just such a great share and inspiration amongst all the sailors. And I know Dave, some of the things that you've been doing um, in your kind of shelter in place time was talking to some youth sailors up in your, uh, hometown of uh, Portland, I think Portland, Maine, or at least that's where you yeah, started yeah. sailing. Um, but um, there's always, I mean, kids coming up in um, the 420 and the laser and the, the youth classes in our country. And they're always have curious questions of like, how do I 
kind of what's my next step? How do I get to the level that you two are at or other athletes are at? Um, and if you had some advice for those um, athletes, Dave, and then Stu, just kind of the, here they are this summer. Some of them are um, maybe on race teams. Some may have some uh, different training um, approaches just given the times, but um, I think there's definitely some opportunities out there and some words of inspiration to our younger generation would go a long way. Yeah. Um... Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We, the three of us, have been have been chatting about that recently uh, because a, a coach kind of posed the same question to us last week. Um, I guess my my number one piece of advice would be to sail a lot of boats and to sail with many different people because, you know, as Stu was just saying, and and as we just talked about, we've learned from each of our. Uh, teammates on these Olympic teams and U.S. sailing teams. And the, the same thing happens with all sorts of people you sail with. And, and I know that when I look back on my junior career, I, I had probably did my most growing when I, when I sailed different boats and learned how to communicate from different, different sailors and tried to take on board their perspectives. You know, how does this person you know, look at sail design. How does this person set up a mast? How, how does this person deal with the race course? And, um, you know, from there, you can learn a lot, you know, not just tricks, but you, you learn how to expand your own questions. Um, so that, that's been pretty powerful for both of us, I believe. And uh, one of the, the constant questions that Stu and I ask ourselves is, is how, how much of the 470 is important to balance out with, with other parts of sailing. And, and um, you know, we've done a lot of, we've done a lot of uh, keelboat sailing and, and lots of classes, and that's been very helpful to our, our dinghy sailing. And, um, you know, in fact, just the other day, we, you know, went the other direction and uh, sparred in lasers against each other. So you, you sort of have to do it all and be, be surprised when you, when you learn from places you weren't expecting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well said. Uh, I'd love to see the laser sparring going on, uh, hopefully in moderate breeze, because not always fair in the laser with different size uh, individuals. Well, <laughs> Thomas Barrows has been uh, has been winning our laser sparring, but he also did an Olympics in the laser, so we don't think that's quite fair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we 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 have yet to do it in some light air, so we'll 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 get him back hopefully soon. <laughs> Yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned, exactly. Um, all right, so um, let's just, you had touched on it a little bit, kind of managing all the different elements that go into kind of the life of campaigning um, and how the delay has impacted your actual training. Um, but are there any silver linings of more time you t um, that you'd want to talk about, kind of what you're working on specifically now in Marion, now that you're back out on the water as a team together, kind of, what that's looking like and kind of what your feelings are and kind of the next couple months, um, given we still know nothing about what the next couple months may look like, um, but how you're working your mindset to, to approach it um, from a strength. Dave, you wanna? Uh, sure, yeah. You know, and we obviously received the good news this week that we've been nominated to the, uh, to the Olympic team and that's definitely a a new feeling to have that nomination with the knowledge that that the olympics are now um, just over a year away and so to some degree you look at it as as a model of efficiency what can i do over this next year now obviously none of us has a crystal ball and can figure out what's what's going to happen with uh uh, COVID and the various lockdowns and travel and everything else. Uh, so our challenge to ourselves on a daily basis has been, you know, how do we make this as efficient as possible? And that might mean we're simply together for a long time. It might mean we're going back to the racing circuit soon. We don't exactly know. And that means we really need to be able to pivot as a team and, and, be efficient in whatever's thrown our way. And if, if it means, hey, we're not, we're not leaving the US for all of 2020, then that's what it means. And 
it's not on us to, to judge it. It's just on us to react to it and make our days as, as powerful and, and effective as possible. Um, now, you know, to your second point, it's fascinating to me how much an athlete can return to the basics and continue to grow. And, um, you know, I, I remember years and years ago, just, you know, watching basketball and, and professional basketball and thinking, you know, wow, I can't believe these guys are, are still practicing the basics. I just always thought that they just were always, you know, they had done that, but it, it's true. You just, you keep having to work on the basics and, and that just never goes away. And that's essentially what we're doing now. Yeah, no, awesome. And congratulations on that, that nomination. That's super exciting. I know um, I'll be following all the way, way there. And I'm sure many, many others will. Um, and uh, just in the 470 class, just, just the nature of you two being in the class for lo so long um, and really you've made great contributions. And I know Dave, you work pretty close with the 470 class kind of in some development. Can you talk a little bit about how um, that experience has gone and just being able to provide the um, athlete perspective um, and value to the, the 470 class, the international class? Uh, sure. The, I have a seat on the, what's called the management committee of the class and I represent North America. Um, there's, uh, there are 10 seats and uh, we, we as a class meet quite often. And, you know, much to the frustration, I'm sure of Stu and, and other people around me, uh, I'll get sucked into some long calls and, and Zoom meetings. But, uh, you know, just like any other class, the class is trying to grow and figure out its footing within the Olympic world. Right now, we are trying to solve what our schedules will be uh, for the rest of the year. And then of course, by proxy, the 2021 schedule. And this is a pretty complicated beast with Olympic sailing because there's all sorts of Olympic qualifications and Olympic trials and, you know, clearly the backdrop of the Olympics next year. So it's, it's not as simple as canceling events and, and waiting another year. Um, and in fact, um, you know, that, that's actually been keeping me busy. And at times it's been um, a really lovely balance, at least for me personally, because I recognize it as a way to give back to the sport. And um, I remember a couple of years ago, we had a Europeans in Bulgaria and I spent a lot of time organizing events for the class. And, uh, and I think Stu even came to me afterwards and said, you know, this was a really wonderful regatta because, you know, you had that going on and, and Stu had his own thing going on and, and uh, we would get together and race and we, uh, we ended up with a fantastic result at that European. So, um, but at, I guess, long story short, trying to balance things like getting back in the sport with also being an athlete is, is always a challenge. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you kind of touched on a fun, fun topic of balancing the the teammate relationship. I know, I mean, traveling and campaigning for the Olympics, you are essentially, uh, I mean, attached um, in a small boat for most of it, if not traveling on an airplane together. But Stu, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what that experience is like um, with Dave as a teammate? And um, I mean, PC stories, but uh, definitely feel free. <laughs> well, you you know, it's one of the great parts of, you know, it's for me, like, I don't think I could campaign in a single handed boat. Having a teammate makes the experience so much richer. It's uh, just in every way. I mean, you know, you have someone to laugh with and have fun with, which is great. You also have someone to work with and problem solve with and uh, or to disagree with. And it's um, all of those things are really healthy and uh, and 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 they help with your growth, you know, as a person, as an athlete. And uh, it, it makes the experience more rewarding. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
Um, Dave, do you have anything to add about uh, being Stu's teammate and what that looks like? Maybe what do you, uh, how do you divvy up the responsibilities? I mean, who goes to the, the grocery store when you get to Palma? Uh, <laughs> who, uh, who takes care of what? Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting when we got together, we, we did a lot of the giving up of responsibilities, but now it's been so many years that it's just automatic. Um, and uh, we don't even think about it. But, um, you know, to answer that specific question, Stu is a much better um, food shopper. You know, he's, he's willing to dedicate time to the aisles, whereas, you know, I basically go in under a stopwatch. I just want to get out of there. Um, but by, by on the flip side, you know, if you need to pack up things at the end of the regatta and make sure that you, you, you've got everything in the right place, you know, that that's my job. Um, you know, so we, the way we organize it is that uh, obviously everybody in the campaign can do any job, but there's always one person who is really the point person, you know, and, um, and we, we divide the boat up that way as well. You know, for example, uh, um, I deal with masts, you know, and then, so, if Stu wants to touch the mast, I say, Hey, wait a second, man. You know, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta talk about, you know, and, uh, I mean, but it, uh, you know, we, I joke, but, uh, that's how we do it. And, um, and it's, it's extremely efficient. Um, you know, another example is, uh, um, Stu is, is, has been honing his Airbnb skills, right? You know, we had, a, we had a few mishaps at some, some pretty bad places. And, uh, but since then it's just been, been impressive he still has put us into some exceptionally exquisite <laughs> locations um at very reasonable prices i might have <laughs> but um yeah that that that's the balance of being on a, on a two-person team is that there 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 is a lot to do you have to be extremely efficient you you do need to recognize where the other person's boundaries are but you also have to poke and prod at those boundaries because otherwise you just don't grow. And, um, you know, that's specifically important during these months because we need to, we need to be able to listen to each other's sailing and, and try to challenge each other's sailing. Yeah, yeah no. Great. Well said. So we, um, we do have a couple questions coming in from the audience that I'll, I'll ask you kind of at random. Um, but, uh, <laughs> A fun one. So um, as you get older, and in parentheses, they say, sorry to say that. Um, <laughs> how do you cool. keep your weight in check and stay competitive in the 470? Um, Stu, do you want to start with that? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the 470 takes small humans. And um, <laughs> it's, it's great if you have a tall guy on the wire. That gives you more leverage. But no matter how you slice it, the helmsman has to be small. Um, and so I, I stay on a fitness program um, and the fitness program allows me to eat reasonably, but it also uh, <laughs> keep, keeps my metabolism up. And uh, <laughs> I think my genes must help as well. But that being said, uh, it is, it's, it's an ongoing challenge to stay the right size for the 470. Uh, running, lifting weights, uh, and then a lot of sailing. If you sail a lot, you don't have a lot of time to eat. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you end up being fairly small if you do that all the time. And I, 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 I feel for the guys in, in weight gain classes, because they have a really hard time keeping on their weight when they do a lot of training. So each discipline has its challenges. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, Dave, do you want to speak a little bit about how you, you maintain your physique and uh, strength out on the wire? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think uh, I've probably been sailing the 470 so long that it's now stunted my growth in some weird way I haven't figured out. But uh, you know, we, Stu and I, I mean, obviously we need to maintain fitness at, a, at an Olympic level and we do, um, we love sailing. That also helps with the, with the fitness as, as Stu's saying. And 
you know, the reality is if we were bigger or smaller, perhaps we would not be in the 470. And so, you know, one of the challenges when youth sailors are getting into Olympic classes is that they need to figure out what class truly fits them in a physical nature. And that, that is, that is a huge question for a lot of these guys. Um, you know, and, and on the Olympic team, it is fascinating to, to just see how everyone approaches weight and what their specific boats do need. You know, I, I, I was staying with Caleb, uh, you know, many moons ago and, and it was fantastic. My fridge was always stocked. It was, it was awesome. So hats off to him, but I definitely couldn't eat two dinners like those guys. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. That leads to another uh, kind of fun question. Uh, what do you eat for lunch when you're out on the water? How did, what does that look like? Um, Stu? There is no lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're I adrenaline. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we usually eat energy bars. Um, there's some really good ones out there. They have a good mix of, of protein, fiber, fats, sugars, carbs. You need everything. Um, and then sometimes we mix in real food. I, uh, we have a, we have a friend who's a professional chef. who's also a 470 sailor and an Olympian. And, um, he's a Canadian friend, but he's helped us out. A, he's helped us out a lot on the way. Um, and, I uh, he, he, he has often made us food. And so, you know, on those days, it's, it's a whole, a whole wheat quinoa wrap with cranberries and, and nuts and some other veggies inside. And so that's easily digestible has a lot of energy. And then, um, he also makes his own energy balls, which is basically an energy bar yeah. but in a ball shape. <laughs> anyway, so we have fun with the food we eat as well. Yeah. But um, I would say, in a nutshell, on days when we sail a lot, we don't have a big lunch, but we try to eat some food immediately after sailing. And there have been some, some other people who've been very supportive and, and helpful and who I. Uh, have given us a, a full meal immediately after training. And so they're, uh, we rely on the people around us really. Yeah. So it, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's interesting. Uh, Stu and I have, have also sailed a bunch of, um, we've sailed Melgus 24s together for years and it's somewhat similar because, uh, at least, uh, for me, not for Stu, because Stu drives the boat. Um, I'll be hiking. And having a big lunch in the Melgus 24 just doesn't work. And it, it's, it's a similar problem to uh, Olympic sailing quite often. Um, but we tend to preload and we tend to uh, uh, get right into the food right afterwards and then eat, eat lightly during the day. Yeah, that seems to be best. We eat a fairly big breakfast. Oh, yeah. Huge. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And it doesn't Almost hurt to have chef eggs. friends on the road. That sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Um, so I'll shifting a little bit more, um, serious, uh, but also could be very fun. And I want to hear from both of you is your favorite place to sail and why and Stu, do you want to start or unless you want to think on it? Cause I, I, know- I have a lot of favorites, you know, <laughs> you're, 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 you're going to have to tolerate a bit of a list here, but, um, <laughs> first of all, Buzzards Bay, wonderful place. It was the first place I sailed and, uh, and I'm sailing here now. It's, it's great. It has a wonderful sea breeze. It's just, it's fantastic. And then, you know, the, the place I've sailed next most Miami. And that's, you know, we all love Miami. There's, there's Biscayne Bay, which has a huge range of conditions. And, and then there's the ocean. You, you get out to the Gulf stream or there, there are ginormous waves. You occasionally see a shark, you see turtles, you see flying fish. It's like being at a water park with wildlife. It's fantastic. And then um, the place I've sailed third most is Palma de Mallorca. 
it's <laughs> that that's a wonderful place to sail as as well it captures all kinds of sea state different types of breezes and and uh fourth but must be on the list rio de janeiro that's uh just absolutely amazing there each each zone of the bay and the ocean has its own type of winds and currents and it's it's a wonderful wonderful backdrop with the with the mountainous hills right there so that was yeah i have wonderful memories from there yeah no i mean all sound awesome uh Palma is definitely on my list, uh, but now maybe I should put add Rio just with that, um, Stu. But uh, Dave, let's hear from you. What are your yeah, well, well, Stu stole the one that was right <laughs> on the on the top of my uh, list uh, is Rio. I mean that that place is fantastic, and um, you know we had so much good training there leading into the Olympics over the number of years that we were training there, and it turned out the Olympics was actually a really awkward you know, breeze cycle, but, uh, just the waves out on the, uh, on the Niederoy and Copacabana courses. Um, I mean, just the stuff of, uh, of legendary photos for the 470 and, and rightfully so, um, you know, an, another place I love sailing, um, uh, is, well, obviously Palma. And I think Palma for me is, is more because it indicates the start of the season. So there's a bit of an excitement that, that is wrapped around it. Um, and the, uh, just to give you a third one, uh, we had a Europeans in, uh, in Bulgaria, uh, a couple years ago. And, you know, I know we were all surprised with how wonderful the conditions were on the Black Sea, you know, having never sailed on the Black Sea, it was just spectacular waves, you know, wind that came in like clockwork, uh, you know, just a fun playground. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple more questions keep funneling in here. So I want to try to get through them. But um, can you two and Dave, we can start with you or Stu, um, kind of talk about the dynamics between you two and your coach, um, Thomas Barris. So you two have been a together for quite a long time. And um, I'm not sure how long you've been working with Thomas, but kind of how that dynamics been working. And um, if you want to get into that a bit. Sure, do you want to start? Or? Yeah, we started in uh, February 2018. Um, that was the first time we officially worked, each, worked with each other as coach and athlete. Um, we've, we've known Thomas for a long time. We, uh, Thomas and I both went to Yale and, um, and then we, 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 we team raced with each other a whole bunch afterwards. Uh, we raced on the same Melges 20. We raced in the same J70. So we have a lot of history. And uh, Dave helped out Thomas and Joe a whole bunch in the, in the 49er as, as they were, were, were preparing for the Rio Olympics. Um, and so it's um, it's been it's been a very healthy dynamic and um, the relationship has, has been evolving over time as, as relationships always do. Um, and, you know, I think we've, we've grown as athletes. Thomas has, Thomas has, has, has grown as a coach. And, uh, but from the very beginning, we were impressed with his work ethic and and his keen observation just uh, like one of his great skills is honest observation and um, you can go a long way with that yeah no awesome dave do you have anything to add or yeah i was Stu said it well uh but thomas is super talented i mean you're talking about a guy who's done two olympics in two different boats um and college sale of the year. He is, you know, younger than us, which is an interesting dynamic that is typically not the case with most uh, Olympic teams. However, uh, you know, you wouldn't know it from the interaction. You might actually say we're the younger, younger parent. <laughs> um, 
And what Thomas brings is a, is a keen sense of, of sailing in a way that uh, he can actually describe and, and bring, bring into our program. Um, he's, he's obviously a phenomenal sailor. And as, as Stu just said, he has a keen eye and, and those are fantastic. You know, the, I think the challenge for other coaches is that, you know, Thomas works so hard that it, it kind of gives people a bad name because, you know, Thomas does everything from taking care of the coach boat to, you know, obviously coaching to logistics, you know, everything in between. And, and, you know, he definitely, he definitely has a full day. I can tell you that. And, and, uh, it's a well-known fact that McNay Hughes likes to sail a lot. Uh, so any coach who is with us eventually gets worn down by the hours on the water and, and Thomas hasn't yet. So we're, we're still testing him on that one. Awesome. Sounds like a, a great guy to take your, your duo into a trio. Uh, yeah, so super exactly. Fun. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. A couple more questions. Um, one, I mean, they want to know what the breeze has been like where you're training today um, out in Marion. So kind of what you've been seeing, if you've been liking it. Um, if Stu, you want to talk a little bit about that? It's a wonderful place. It's, uh, it's uh, one of his favorite. Yeah, in, in fact, <laughs> I, I put it number one on the list. <laughs> uh, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of 14 to 17 knots. And I, uh, you know, sometimes dips down to 10 knots every once in a while, 18, 19, but it's, I, uh, you know, um, I'm sure the, I'm sure the breeze pattern will change and we'll get some, some stronger sea breezes at some point, but also some lighter sea breezes, but, um, you get a lot of the medium overpowered conditions. Oh, that's and, a good one. Yeah. We've also had some fun one, uh, in the, uh, I guess it's the Cape Cod Canal. Yeah, yeah. And and when the when we're fighting adverse current downwind and big waves, it's uh, you know, it's it, it's fantastic. So yeah, um, really enjoy them. Yeah, no, sound. I mean, sounds awesome. Can't, can't beat New England coast. <laughs> um. All right. So here's non-sailing, but definitely a good question: Is what um were your favorite childhood athletes growing up, and why? Um, and Stu, we can start with you unless you, you need a little time to think of who, who really inspired you. I'll take a little bit of time to think. Dave, oh. you're on the spot. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's clearly Michael Jordan. I don't need to say why. I mean, he's, he's just the athlete. It's just incredible. And, and I know a lot of people have been talking about Jordan recently because of the, uh, of the last dance documentary, but you know, he captivated me as, as a, as a young, young kid. So for sure, hands down, you know, and you're also talking about a guy who, you know, people forget he won a gold medal at the 1984 Olympics. You know, people just think it was the 1992 games. So pretty impressive. Dated yourself a little bit there, Dave. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Stu, what about you? Oh, my dad loves watching tennis, and so, and so that was always playing on the TV. And we got to see a lot of Andre Agassi, Jim Courier, Ivan Lendl. And so those guys, I, I enjoy watching those guys. Yeah, no, awesome. Um, okay, so I think um, we'll wrap it up with this last question, um, and it's a good one. I think it's interesting, and you two will have a lot of perspective on it going through um, a couple games and being in the game for so long. Is um, What is one thing that uh, U.S. Sailing and just us as sailors could do for you and the team for the games, kind of from a support standpoint, um, fan base standpoint uh, what what would you love to see us sailors kind of kind of do this next uh year and a half you know i think because we have a little bit of an extended time and us sailors were thinking about the olympics you know obviously prior to to uh the pandemic the us sailors were thinking that the olympics were going to be this this summer, 2020, 
And now we all have a bit of a pause. So the Olympics is now in people's minds. Um, and that's a fantastic thing. So the challenge I would give is to have the Olympics part of our culture for the entire quad, um, just so that it's not something people get interested in in the final year or after people are, are selected for the Olympic team, but, but truly follow the athletes throughout the, throughout the years. And um, it, it's a pretty lonely road for, for an athlete. I mean, yes, we, we do have a lot of fun doing what we do. We do learn a lot, but it, it's, a, it's a hard road. And it's often a challenge to uh, connect people to that road early on in the quads. Yeah, towards that end, you know, a, a, a sustained interest and ability to professionalize the Olympic road, it's, it's never too late to make it more professional. Um, you know, any, any extra hours and rigor and resources of any kind can be, can be well used and will yield dividends. Um, mm -hmm. but towards the end of, of, of what Dave was saying, the, uh, you know, the, professionalization that um not in the year or two prior to the olympics but through through your career leading up to your peak olympics so that um every day can be an efficient building block um that'll you know give you the best the best chance of your best performance when it counts. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure one of the most aspire, inspiring things is knowing that your country is at home rooting for you when you're out on the road. And I mean, especially at the, the games itself, but along that journey goes a long yeah. way for sure. Um, well, that kind of wraps us up for this uh, late afternoon. And I, I can't thank you boys uh, or gentlemen so um, enough for, for joining and taking some time out of your day to to hop on the portal and share a little bit about yourselves. And again, congratulations on the, the nomination to the upcoming games. Thank, um, you. Thank you. Best of luck on, on your training this summer. And it's great to see that you and Thomas are all together and um, up in Marion training and getting some good time on the water. So really looking forward to following you and um, yeah, awesome, awesome stuff, boys. So um, thank you. Well, thank you, Justine. It's been a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, no, this is great fun. And uh, for everyone out there listening in, if you're enjoying uh, the Starboard Portal, please uh, kind of support the efforts to build community of active and engaged sailors um, by purchasing or renewing your uh, U.S. sailing membership. We have a lot of great content um, around just the sport in general and other athletes coming up. Um, so thanks to the U.S. sailing members, um, we're able to adapt and uh, evolve to better serve sailors. Uh, with content like this. So boys, thank you for contributing to um, today's entertainment. And again, um, all the best uh, up in uh, New England. Thanks everyone. Thanks Justine. Thank you everyone. All right, we're off the air. <laughs> <laughs>